uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Katie Canalicchio, who did her medical school training in Texas. She did her residency at Baylor uh, College of Medicine, and she did her fellowship training at the Seattle Children's Hospital. Uh, she was heavily recruited, uh, and we were fortunate enough to get her here, and she's been a, a great addition to our practice. And I'm thrilled to tell everybody who don't know, who doesn't know that she's to be a mother again soon. Uh, and I'm very happy for her. And she's going to talk about the identification and treatment of hydronephrosis. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone. So today I will focus on prenatal and antenatal hydronephrosis, the grading systems available the initial management of newborns with hydronephrosis and list some of the possible ideologies. I don't have any disclosures. So hydronephrosis is dilation of the renal pelvis here or the calyces, which are more peripheral. Some amount of dilation of the renal pelvis is actually considered normal, but any dilation out of the calyces is abnormal. And then you, hydroureter, for, hydroureter specifically refers to dilation of the ureter. And then there are several grading systems available. So I was going to go over some of those with you guys. The Society for Fetal Urology Classification or SFU system is probably the most widely used among pediatric urologists. And it's based on the extent of calicil dilation, involvement of minor calices and the presence of parenchymal thinning. So in grade one, you can see uh, that urine causes slight separation of the renal pelvis. In grade two, the renal pelvis is further dilated, and so are some of the calyces. In grade three, all of the calyces are uniformly dilated. And then in grade four, that's when you start to see some of the parenchyma is thinned out. So these photos actually come from an interactive website called CEVL. So you can Google that and actually go in and play with some of these images to learn more about the SFU grading system. Um, and it highlights the areas of the kidney that are dilated for the different SFU grades. So you can see here, this is first grade with image uh, one here shows SFU grade one where you can see slight dilation of the pelvis. And then here, this is actually highlighting the different areas of the kidney um, that may be dilated. Uh, given the grade. So this is uh, the pelvis, the major calyces, out further are the minor calyces, and then the parenchyma. An important distinction between grade two and three are that all the minor calyces are uniformly dilated in grade three. And then when you have grade four, that's when you see uh, that the parenchyma is starting to thin. Um, most define that as parenchyma thinning more than uh, under four millimeters of thickness, and that's that red area. Another classification system used is actually just looking at the anterior posterior, posterior renal pelvis diameter, which is just a measurement based on the transverse ultrasound image. And it's the maximal diameter of the intrarenal pelvis. Um, <clears throat> and so some radiologists and or urologists will grade just based on that alone. Another common way to, to grade is just using descriptive terms, mild, moderate, and severe. Um, unfortunately, that is a little more subjective and harder uh, to have interrelatability regarding that. Um, this is a classification system that's newer called the urinary tract dilation or UTD system. Um, and it takes into account, into account both the degree of hydronephrosis uh, plus other findings such as bladder abnormalities and ureteral abnormalities. And so we'll categorize um, prenatally um, the patients into low risk or increased risk, and then postnatally into three groups, low, intermediate, and high risk. And so a recent study looking at the available literature on hydronephrosis showed great variability in the grading systems that were used among different specialists and even among different case reports. The SFU was the most widely used, followed by the UTD. And I think this is important because it highlights uh, the importance of using a consistent grading system, both in the literature and then also in clinical use. So I just wanna talk about the UTD system a little bit more. 
Um, it's both a prenatal and postnatal, as I mentioned before, and it includes renal appearance, uh, which includes the anterior pelvis renal diameter, the calus sill dilation, parenchymal thickness and appearance, as well as ureteral and bladder uh, appearance. And so the, uh, they, uh, to avoid confusion, the consensus panel that came up with the UTD system actually recommended not use, uh, recommend using the word dilation and sticking away from some of these more nonspecific terms, but you're still gonna see these in uh, radiology reports. Uh, I just want to go over the various ones that are available. So this is a schematic of the UTD system showing a transview view of the mid interpolar kidney. The different degree of calus cell dilation are shown in a clockwise fashion. The second view shows longitudinal appearance of the UTD system. The P1 category demonstrates central calus cell dilation, excuse me, this one. The P2 category uh, demonstrates peripheral calus cell dilation, that's further out. And the P3 category, again, then shows some actual parenchymal abnormalities, thinning and cystic changes. <clears throat> the chart, this is a chart details the cutoffs for normal and the two different category, categories that are seen prenatally. Classification is based on the most concerning feature. At 16 to 27 weeks, an APRD, APRD diameter under four millimeters is considered normal. And then after 28 weeks of gestation, if it's under seven millimeters, it's considered normal. And then these are the cutoffs for the other classifications within that prenatal system. So UTDA1 is considered low risk and so does not require as much follow-up. So this is a recommended diagram for follow-up prenatally. Um, you can see here that another prenatal ultrasound is recommended after 32 weeks gestation and then two additional ultrasounds postnatally at these time frames. The UTD A23 pl places the patient or the fetus at more increased risk. And so they are recommending more frequent ultrasounds and then um, consulting specialists such as us. <clears throat> and this chart is the postnatal. So the ones before were prenatal. So now this one's actual postnatal classification cutoffs. Um, and once again, you use the most worrisome finding. Normal findings are, uh, would be for an APR diameter under 10 millimeters. And so then you can see here for the different risk categories, low, intermediate, and high, the different cutoffs. So when considering postnatal management, uh, you look at these risk categories and you can see here, a lot of it says, discretion of clinician, discretion of clinician, discretion of clinician. So a lot of it is up to the provider. Um, personally, most of my, most of the patients that I see that have UTD P1, I'm not recommending off the bat VCG prophylactic antibiotics or a renal LASIK scan. Uh, when you look over here at the, the high risk categories, typically I am, I am going ahead and recommending all three of those things in addition to the follow-up ultrasound. <clears throat> And so I think this photo just highlights that there's really, you know, no specific consensus on the management of postnatal prenatal hydronephrosis. Practice patterns are going to vary, and it's often dependent on the grading system employed. And I think that's why it's very important to look at the imaging to understand um, what it is that's really going on. Um, and so let's move on to etiology. So. Prenatal hydronephrosis, uh, now that we have a lot of ultrasounds happening, we're diagnosing it a lot more frequently than probably 20, 30 years ago. And so it's a very common abnormality seen prenatally and it'll occur in 5% of all pregnancies. Thankfully, most of them are gonna be mild in those low risk categories. 90% um, have a chance of being transient and resolve spontaneously if they, if they meet that uh, category of mild. And so up to two thirds of prenatal hydronephrosis, as I said, are transient, which is great. And that's good to counsel families on. Uh, the next most common causes are a ureteral pelvic junction obstruction, um, followed by vesicle ureteral reflux. Other more rare causes are listed here that you could possibly see, such as a mega ureter, a duplicated kidney with a ureterosil that's causing some type of obstruction, posterior urethral valves, or even urethral atresia. 
And so when you're when you're thinking about the, the diagnosis, the likelihood of a certain diagnosis is based on the grade of the hydronephrosis seen. So if you have a mild hydronephrosis grading, you're more likely to have the, the transient, the, the one that's gonna resolve 90%, great. Um, less likely to have some of these other things that I mentioned. Now, as you get into those more severe categories, your chances of having something that needs to be intervened on become more likely such as a UPJ obstruction or a reflux. Um, and still we're even considering valves or even obstruction lower down as the ureter enters the bladder. That's what a UVJ obstruction is. And when you see hydro-ureter, uh, similarly, you're also considering some of these other diagnoses that you wouldn't have been otherwise. So the ultrasound um, typically should not be performed before the second day of life, once the baby's born. And that's because of the relative dehydration at birth. So if you perform it early, it would lead to possible underestimation of the true level of hydronephrosis. However, in certain circumstances, we may ask for it immediately. And that's when we're worried about something that we may have to intervene on, such as significant bilateral hydronephrosis, a baby with a solitary kidney to document that the, the good kidney is normal, or if we have suspicion of valves, <clears throat> posterior urethral valves, and these are things that are, we're gonna act on more quickly, and we may ask to go ahead and get that ultrasound regardless of the time frame. A VCUG should be obtained uh, when you see that patient with that moderate to severe bilateral hydronephrosis because you wanna rule out the valves. And then also when you're seeing mega ureter. Um, <clears throat> so those are just my special points. Uh, does anybody have any questions?